Hey, so how do you transition to a DevOps job without a background in software development? Well, as it turns out, there are a ton of areas of expertise in DevOps that don't have anything to do with writing code. So in this video, we're going to explore what some of those areas are and how you can use that to apply those skills to your own situation. So now there are kind of two different ways that you can look at DevOps. There's the practical approach and the philosophical approach. Now the philosophical approach is good and you should definitely spend some time learning about that and understanding the way that it um, applies to how we develop software. But it doesn't really translate directly into things that I can do as a beginner. So that's where we take a look at the practical approach. So the practical approach kind of just looks at how we get code from a developer's workstation out into production so that our customers and our company can realize the benefit of that work that that developer has done. So let's dig through some of the high level pieces of that pipeline and see which ones we can pull out and apply to our own situation without a background in development. So the first one that pops into my mind is CICD or continuous integration and continuous deployment. And what that refers to is getting the code that a developer has checked into the repository ready to be deployed out to production. So that can involve a bunch of different tasks like running tests against the code to ensure that nothing's broken, running linters to make sure that the code conforms to different style guidelines, um, building or compiling the code or building Docker images. And so all of those things take place on a build server whether that's a Jenkins server that you own and host yourself or a third-party SaaS type application like um, GitHub Actions or CircleCI, Azure DevOps or AWS Code Pipeline. Now, the thing about this is, is almost all of that is set up and orchestrated through configuration. So you don't actually need to know how to write code for the most part to implement this. So it's a perfect place where you can jump in and start adding DevOps practices without knowing how to write code. So now once you have your application deployed, you're gonna want some way to monitor and make sure that your application is healthy besides finding out because your customers are complaining on social media, right? So that's where monitoring, logging, and alerting come into play. So monitoring is just getting performance metrics from your application, either through scraping metrics that the application is publishing or having the application push them to a monitoring server itself. So there's a ton of ways that you can make this happen that don't require any coding skills. Some of my favorites are Prometheus with Grafana or using the Elk stack from Elasticsearch or a hosted solution like Datadog. Now, once you've got that implemented, and you've got your monitoring in place, the next logical progression from there is to set up some alerting. So when a particular monitor point or data point hits a certain level, you wanna send out an automated alert so that someone can respond to it. And then the follow on step to that would be logging. So now you've got an alert indicating something's not right in your application. And so rather than going out to all of the individual servers that make up your infrastructure, you want to ship your logs to a centralized location so that you can have one place to go and find all of your logs. And um, something like Splunk is a great paid solution for that. Elk from Elastic is another great solution for handling your logs. Now, the thing I like about this particular approach is it gives you a ton of opportunities to work directly with the development team because you're going to have to have this conversation about, well, what should we monitor? Um, what should we, what are the appropriate levels to be sending alerts on? What are we logging and which of those logs do we need to be shipping off somewhere else? So you get this in-depth interaction with your development team, which gives you more opportunities to see the code that they're writing and how they're architecting the application, which is going to ultimately translate to you taking on some development responsibilities yourself. Another no-code or low-code application or project that you can take on is in configuration management. So you've got all of these servers that make up your application. Do you know how they're actually configured and can you reproduce that reliably? 
If they were hand-built, you probably can't. So by taking on a configuration management project, you're gonna dig in and understand how those servers are built and then use configuration tools like Terraform or Ansible or CloudFormation to recreate those servers from a documented process that can be tracked and managed over time. Now, the side benefit of doing this is it also makes it easy for you to set up development environments for your development team so that you can confidently state that they're working with a production-like environment whenever they're developing code. And now, no matter where you work, there's an opportunity to focus on security. And I, I tend to look at security from three different angles. So you have the external security. You know, what knobs and dials are you exposing to the public internet that an attacker could twist and turn to try and exploit your system? The second level is application security. You know, what libraries and packages and dependencies are you using in your application that need to be updated because there's a newer version that contains security patches available? And then the third level is user security. You know, you don't want everyone on your team to have super admin access in your environment. So what are the right levels of permissions that different members on your team need in order to do their job? Now, this is another area that provides an opportunity for great collaboration with the software development team. You know, it's said that the only secure application is one that's not connected to the internet. Well, that's probably not gonna work for your company. So now you've got this series of compromises that you have to work with through collaboration with the development team to say, okay, here's the gold standard for security. Here's you know, the opposite end of that. Where can we meet in the middle that provides a moderate level of security without impacting the ability of our customers to interact with us as a business? Now, once you have all of that done, that can lead to a follow-on task of like, okay, here's all these security practices we have in place. Which ones of those can we automate and how do we automate that? And there are tons more of scenarios like this we can use with the DevOps practices in mind. But I think if you start with these, it's gonna open up this Pandora's box for you that just shows you all of these other things that you can go work on as well. Now, eventually you're definitely gonna to wanna to learn some coding skills but you can deal with that when the time comes. And by taking this approach, you're actually gonna have like some practical applications or practical implementations of DevOps practices so that when you do get ready to learn that, pro that coding language, you've actually got some idea of what the end result is gonna look like, which is gonna make the knowledge retention of learning to code stick that much better because you know why you're doing this thing. So if you enjoyed this video, check out another video I made, which is um, DIY DevOps projects. And so it's a list of 11 different DevOps style projects that you can tackle on your own to build DevOps skills and help you land that DevOps job. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.